And uh, so shortly R after RSA, uh, what's proposed, that clearly uh, the, the, uh, the field of theoretical computer science are fascinated by, you know, whether you can break it is, right? Because uh, it is a fascinating statement. So at that time, um, you can see RSA is broadly built upon two intuitive assumptions. Uh, and uh, to some degree, that uh, the, the encryption scheme itself could then somehow uh, mathematically pin this down. Why is uh, factoring is hard? So, so how do you define factoring is hard? It's actually not that easy to define either. Okay. So, so the assumption that come closer to RSA that one can make is that uh, if your n come from the product of two larger primes, and if they are drawn in random, then, so this is called the, 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 the average, not even, uh, this is called average case complexity. So namely, on average, it's very hard to, uh, to, to factor. Okay, so if you take a random one with high probability, uh, the odd algorithm which we know will take more than polynomial time. Okay, so 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 this actually gave a rise of a uh, uh, sort of repeated push of complexity theory in terms of the statement of average case complexity. Particularly, which problem is hard on average? Right. So, for example, if you look at sorting. Uh, with respect to quick sort, we all knew that in the worst case, in quick sort will take quadratic time. On average, it will take n times log n time. So, in some sense, sorting uh, if, with respect to quick sort is cheaper on average than uh, in the worst case. But on average, means that your data come from certain distribution, say a random permutation, right? So. Because it's possible that a certain problem that are hard on few instances, few instant instances, but may not be hard overall, right? So, so, so that's why the, the crypto are somehow built upon slightly stronger statement of complexity theory, right? It's not just something as a statement of problem like TSP is hard, TSP is NP complete, but it could be the complete problem are fairly pathological. But as a class, it can be hard, right? But, but on the other hand, if you randomly draw a few cities, uh, even of a large uh, weighted graph, it could be easy, right? So, so, that, so if that's the case, it means that TSP is easier on average, but hard in the worst case, right? So in fact, so, some of the problems are, from a pro, uh, approximation perspective, are easy to solve if, for example, your graph come from just dense graph. You know, if you draw a random graph, each idea has probability half, then certain NP hard problem are easy to solve or are easy to approximate. Right. So, uh, so, so this gave rise a heavy study of average case complexity, and I will allude to them, but I will not overly uh, get into their, uh, you know, brief subtlety here. Uh, so, so clearly, on the, on the constructive side, it built upon testing prime is easy, right? And uh, more than that, GCD is easy, is easy, which means you can compute the inverse. And more than that, exponentiation is easy, right? So it's built upon this uh, dichotomy of uh, uh, landscape in assuming certain computational problem, right? On one hand, we want to say, because something is hard, it's hard for you to break the code. And on the other hand, we want to say, something is easy that you can implement your code in the right direction, right? So that's why its efficiency comes from a batch of uh, algorithmic result to say certain construction are easy, like getting inverse, getting multiplicative inverse, taking exponentiation, allow you to, to, to do uh, encoding. But fundamentally, attempt try to say factoring is hard. 
and particularly the assumption of factoring is hard is this average case each statement. Namely, if you take a equal to pq and pq are random primes, each have n bits, then as average case complexity, so namely, there's no algorithm whose average case complexity in this domain is polynomial. Or in other words, uh, there's you know exceptionally large fraction of numbers that you cannot factor if you draw according to this distribution. Okay. So, so then, so in the next few years, fundamentally, people attempt just to prove this that if some assumption about factoring is hard, then RSA is unbeatable. Like last time, I mentioned that if RSA is unbreakable, then its last bit is unbreakable. Right, that, that, that's what I did last time, right? Using the simple homomorphic uh, properties. If RSA is uh, unbeatable, then the last bit is unbeatable, right? So, so, so this statement was never actually proved, and is today is still open. Largely because in RSA, what revealed is n, not just n, and also with another number called e, which uh, you know the property that the GCD e uh, times p minus 1 and q minus 1 is equal to 1. Right, so this is a phi n. So, so, so this additional <coughs> this additional uh, data somehow make the connection between RSA encryption and factoring statement hard to connect. Right. So that's why eventually the field only draw the illusion that factoring is hard. Because we knew if we can factor, the whole thing will break. Right? It's just so far no one knows any other way going other than going around factoring, right? Now, right? But there could be some magic way Somehow you don't need the factor, then you can still decode, right? Because the official RSA statement is that, uh, suppose even in random case, is that uh, imagine you draw a message randomly from the n star, then you are given m to the e called n, right? You give this random. So, so you can say they all have this average case each statement, right? <coughs> If you take a random instance, if you see this number, you see the cipher text. So from the cipher text C, N, and E, can you return a number which is that? Right. So this is called directly breaking RSA. Right. I see from cipher text, I knew my public key, I want to directly build, uh, uh, break the. Uh, Break the uh, separate text. Okay, and uh, so this statement usually is stated in this random mind. It's on the average case, namely I'm drawing m uniformly and random. Right. So that's usually the statement. And uh, suppose we call this the hardness of RSA. Right. So this usually is called the RSA assumption. Right. And uh, for a long time. People want to establish RSA assumption and factoring assumption are somewhat equivalent. And that has never been done. Okay? And there's increasing evidence that such proof may be challenging. Okay. So whenever, you know, for years things couldn't, cannot be proofs, people actually try to prove proof this is hard. Is it sort of this meta theorem? Okay? But uh, I may not overly go there, but there's a great subtleties between this uh, breaking this code and this basic assumption factoring so on. Okay. So, <coughs> so along the way, uh, Michael Rabin examined a particular encryption scheme. Uh, this scheme very RSA-like, although uh, it, it's not, uh, it, it didn't have all the RSA properties. 
but he's able to at least tie the complexity of uh, the security of his encryption scheme back to factoring assumption. Right? So that's one of the first time at least people see evidence they can be connected. Right? Because a research are often done by either a beautiful theorem is proved, or sometimes people lay a bridge to see something is possible. Then people are looking for what the most general statement behind it. Okay? So this is a, one of the, in my mind, quite enabling uh, steps. So, so Rabin's scheme is following. He said that instead of uh, using uh, RSA, like you have to produce E randomly. Right? Remember, we, we used to draw this randomly. We used to draw PQ randomly. Right. So that's in the generation, right? PQ randomly and E draw randomly from the N star. He said, <coughs> so maybe you should just do a simple scheme called N equal to PQ like before. He will bank on factoring is hard. And then he said, let me just make E permanently equal to 2. So at least encryption is efficient in this way, right? He said, here is my encryption scheme. So this is my key generation, GEN. So my key generation just generated N. I choose two larger prime and multiply. And later on, he will put in some uh, constraint on the primes. Uh, they may or may not eventually to be mathematically important, but I will use his restriction. And the encryption scheme, he's an encryption with M. Again, M is drawn from the N star. Right, that's your Play text. Here the encryption is just m square. Okay, this is this is what he said. His encryption is just m square model. Okay. So now, how do we decrypt? So this is quite a brave move, right? He just said simply say square your number model. He said he believes it's a Scramble enough. Right. So you have to take your mind away from integers. <coughs> you have to think of this in modular arithmetic. Because as the integers, this clearly is not an encryption scheme. Why? Because we can take square root, which we learned also in high school. Right? Taking square root in integer domains is a polynomial time computable function. So here you have to understand. Everything is played around. You are taking modular arithmetic. But isn't it unique? Uh, good, right? So RSA is unique, right? The RSA actually, <coughs> the, the plain text and cipher text is a one to one mapping. Very good, right? So that's what I said. Is RSA like? However, it's not RSA, right? It doesn't have all the properties. So because here to here is a, a, a you know if you look at here when e is a, a has a multiplicative inverse against phi n this is a permutation of the message space right because uh, from c and m this is uniquely mapped by there's a bijection right because the other way to map back is a m to the e inverse is equal to mod phi n. Right? So this equal to C, right? So, so we have this bijection, so which means that nothing was overmapped, right? But here, instantly, I think your question is, is this unique? And first question is no. The answer is clearly no, right? Because uh, uh, how many messages can map into the same square? There will be two messages mapped into the same square. You think? Could be more. Okay, so so let's examine how many messages actually can map in the same square. You think it was two two at least two messages, right? You you can see if I do this, uh, because E and C, because M square is equal to negative M square, right? <coughs> Agree? M square is equal to negative M square mod n. Agree? So, which means that uh, clearly in this case, at least two messages will map there. And actually, I've been profound to say there are four messages mapped there. 
This is related with any of my discussion from last time. I will come back to review this. Okay. So, so clearly it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So that's why it's a little bit provocative state uh, schema, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a milestone result in part because it accomplishes some things that people want to accomplish with the other scheme. And it's also highlighted the fundamental question about quadratics. Okay? It, it highlighted two things. Because this quadratic thing occurred, perfect square thing occurred in the testing of prime, including, <laughs> including uh, the, 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 the uh, Solovitz Strassen scheme, which we briefly discussed, or Miller Rubin scheme. They all used the they used this so called perfect square in some module N. Okay? So, so here, he's essentially asking to consider this, you know, open-minded, right? So the main question, so let's put aside what is uniqueness thing. Because at that time, he also made a, a, a light statement on this, which just let people know his focus is not on this, you couldn't uniquely decode it anymore. It's mostly try to tie back to the factory. It's hard, okay? So he said, you know, when you write uh, English, Letters. So, and you encode ASCII into M. <coughs> and suppose there's another message called negative M in ASCII. Do you think it's still in English? <laughs> he says, with high probability, it's not in English. He said, that's why if I give you negative, well, I give you M or negative M, you can tell why it's not. He said, that is not a problem. And he made a light statement, but which is a <coughs> genuine statement, which in general, for our coding, you can pick put a certain type, that the negation may move it out of the type. So, so you may have a few phantom plain text, as long as they don't fill in the syntax, then you can still uniquely decode it. Right. You, you agree? That, that thing, at least heuristically, we can manage. Okay, so let's put that aside. So what, how did he make, is computing square root hard? That's become the first question. Decoding, you have to get square root, right? Decoding, you must get square root. So is square root hard? Modern. So this is a beautiful question. Slightly provocative in part because square root is easy in our usual sense, in real, in complex, in integer, in rational. We knew how to take a square root, right? Because there's numerical ways you can compute as precise as you want. You can actually determine the patterns of the periodicity or something that exists. But, 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 but here, it's taking square root hard, right? So he's able to prove that uh, if factoring is hard, to a large degree, taking square root is very hard. So he wants to relate is square root hard back to the question of factoring hard. Okay. So this by examining this A, we will learn a little bit number theory, which we need anyway. And B uh, it allows us to see some subtleties of statement can be made on certain uh, encryption scheme. Okay. So, a any question up to here? So it's taking square root harm. Right. So, so, so let's consider uh, the case, the initial case that uh, he considered, and very often uh, the schema using this assumption, and I will highlight why it's convenient assumption. So, so here is Rebbe's scheme. He said, in the generation case, he will generate two numbers. N equal to a P <coughs> where P Q random primes 
reasonable property such that P mod 4 is equal to Q mod 4 is equal to 3. Okay. So there's only two cases, either P mod 4 equal to 1 or 3, right? You cannot mod it equal to 2. Uh, that, 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 that will be an even number. Right. So, so, uh, so, so p mod four can be either zero, one, two, three, and if p is a prime, odd prime, then p can, mod four can only be equal to one or three. And uh, p mod four equal to three has some beautiful properties, and and this usually in the domain called the Blom number. Okay. So who is Blom? Uh, Blum actually is a PhD advisor of uh, uh, Len Edelman. So, so, so Blum is a PhD advisor of Edelman. And he's the first person who isolated this family of prime are somehow has cleaner property for proof or for building particles. Uh, later on, we'll see some scheme in terms of pseudo random number generation and so on. It, it all carry similar characterization. Okay. I will also explain why mod 3 somehow is a good property for now. Okay? So this is a key generation. Okay? So again, encryption literally go m go to m square. Okay? Then decryption, so how how can he decrypt? Right? That's what, what we will say, how can he decrypt? Right. So decryption he will decrypt as the following. So this is where I will illustrate every perfect square actually has four rules rather than two. Okay? So, so remember the Chinese remainder theorem. <coughs> so remember the Chinese remainder theorem. Right? Chinese remainder theorem said that uh, uh, the n star to the n, the p star, the q star, right? So it's uh, equal to the uh, isomorphic to <coughs> this decomposition, okay? So if you have p and q, you can look at the how to take a root there, right? Suppose, you know, uh, uh, c is equal to m square, right? So if you, let's just take a what this means in this uh, cross product term, right? So this means that the C is really equal to M square mod P and M square mod Q. C is really isomorphic to that number, right? It's a, it's a map to this number, okay? So, <clears throat> so if you look at M mod P and M mod Q, because we knew DP star and DQ star, a few, right? So when you multiply and uh, add and multiply, they are few. So if they are, uh, so this is a plus and uh, multiply, they are few. So this is a few, okay, I, uh, including zero. So the, uh, dp plus minus, uh, this, is, this is a few. So what's the property of field? In a field, a quadratic equation has two roots. Okay, in a field, quadratic equation has two roots. You can't have more than two roots. Okay? So, so, so this root in the field, taking a square root is really aligned with our old belief. It's just plus minus a number. <laughs> right? So, which means that uh, uh, if you take a square root, so let me just literally write like this way, right? So, we are taking a square root like <coughs> this, right? So, the real number of square root is really plus minus m mod p and plus minus m mod q, right? So all those four pairs are square roots, right? All those things, when you square them, will become m square mod p, m square mod q, right? So this is why in the zp star, uh, the magical algebra <coughs> manifests itself to be Every perfect square has four roots, right? And because you have a plus minus in each of the coordinates, so that's give you the four coordinates. 
from possibilities. Okay? So, so, so you can think that uh, reading scheme, you just simply say, uh, if I'm able to take a square root against P and Q, then I can decode. That's my private key, right? Because his private key, his public key is this. So public key is N, private key is equal to PQ. Right? So his private key is PQ. Right? He at least wants to say in a private key I can take a square root. Okay? That's, that, that's at least what he said. Right? So let, let me just think about how to take square root in mod P. Then clearly you can take mod, uh, square root of mod Q. If you can do this, then you can use the Chinese remainder theorem to take a square root in here. Okay? If you're able to take a square root mod P, you're able to take square root of mod Q. The Chinese remainder theorem allows you to take a square root mod N. Okay, so then this is one of his constructive ways to say I'm able to take square root. So then he will eventually prove mathematically if somebody else can take square root without knowing PQ, that algorithm can be used to produce PQ. Just like what we did last time. Um, if someone gets last bit of RSA, that person can break RSA. Here, his eventually security level, he will prove a statement. If someone can take a square root, <coughs> can take a square root against n, you know, against more than n, then with exceptional high probability, he's going to produce a PQ. So which means he breaks the code. So this is a reduction to the factoring is hard. That's why he can relate the decoding of his algorithm with the factoring. Okay? So, so let's pause there a little bit. Let me at least get taking square root out first, right? So how do you take a square root of mod p, right? So how do we take a square root of mod p? Right, suppose I say c equals m square mod. So, so let me use a different method. d equals m square mod p, right? So, so this is where the so-called Blum property is handy because uh, uh, um, it's mod f uh, 4 equals 3. I will use that property. So, so my Blum, uh, you know, Blum mentioned this numbers like in the 70s, and he's a, he's a very charming guy. I think he's a, he, grew, he grew up in Venezuela, then he came to this country, and uh, he ultimately he won the award for his work. He studied under uh, Minsky, who is uh, one of the early founders of uh, perception and AI. And uh, so, so when most people in the field, when they rise, uh, become senior, they celebrate traditionally the 60th birthday. So that's why you, can, you see a lot of 60th birthday manifest. And then sometimes people begin to celebrate 70th birthday. And uh, so, so Blum actually said that he's not celebrating 70th birthday. He actually celebrated last year at CMU, his 77th birthday. Uh, no, 70, not 70, or oh, 77 first. So, so he said, what is 77? 77 is equal to, so he's not a prime, clearly, right? Because it's equal to 7 times 11. Then he said, uh, but both 7 and 11 are prime, uh, are blonde number. And this is, he said, the last blonde number may be, I may be able to reach the product of two Plum number, right? So this is mod three, mod four equal to three, mod four equal to three, right? Okay. Uh, brilliant mind and wonderful uh, speakers too. So, uh, so, so, so let me use this property. At least take square root of mod p, and then at least we now we know if you know pq is easy to take square root. Okay. So, so how do we take a square root? And uh, so this. Is where, for example, Euler's formula-ish is a very good formula. Remember, <coughs> how do Euler's formula to tell whether you're perfect square or not? They raise the power to p minus 1 over 2. Right? The Euler's condition to decide whether the number is perfect square or not, they just raise to the power p minus 1 over 2. And if your number happens to be perfect square, that 2 will cancel that 2, it will raise m to p minus 1, it will be equal to 1. Right? So Euler's equation, Euler's equation is that m p minus 1 divided by 2 mod n 
mod P belong to plus or minus 1. And if you hit plus 1, your perfect square, you hit negative 1, your square root of the 1. Right? So you can treat this almost like a square root of 1. Right? And uh, so clearly, when m is, uh, uh, so let me use the number called z. If z is a square equal to m squared, then square will cancel with p. That's why I gave you the plus one. Otherwise, it's give you negative one. So, <clears throat> so if a number p is mod four equal to three, then the following number is actually very interesting. So let's look at this number z to the power. Divide by four p minus one p plus one. Okay. Is p plus one divided by four an integer? In this case, p plus one divided by four integer. I just said yes, right? Because uh, when multiple four equal to three, you put back a one, it gives you multiple of four, right? So this actually beautiful is integer, right? Just like uh, back then. When Euler asks, is p minus 1 divided by 2 integer? Then you say yes, because p is a prime and odd. Right? So here's 2. If, if p plus 1 divided by 4, plus 4 is integer, and because it's mod 4 equal to 3, then it clearly is an integer. OK? So, 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 so let's, under the assumption, let's say z equal to m squared. So e equals m squared, we want to compute m. Or we want to compute a root of m. Right? Either plus or minus m. Right? So, 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 so let's look at the support if I put m this way, just to see what happens. Right? So if I take m squared times p plus 1 divided by 4. Right? So, so this is a taking square root, right? Because we think z is a perfect square, then we, we want to take a square root. So what is this quantity is equal to, oh, I'm taking mod, mod p now, right? So this mod p. So this clearly is equal to m to the p plus 1 divided by 2. Mod p. Is p plus 1 divided by 2 an integer? It's still integer, clearly. Yeah, p plus <coughs> 1 divided by 4 is integer. Divided by 2 clearly is integer, right? So, so this is equal to m p minus 1 divided by 2 plus, uh, plus what? <coughs> um, plus uh, 2, right? Plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. Plus 1, right? Because when, when you plus 1, when you multiply this 2, it becomes 2. Subtract one minus one, right? So, the, so p plus one is equal to p minus one divided by two plus one. This, this is a universal be true, right? Okay, this is universal. Be good. Okay, so at least uh, sometimes I can write equations. Uh, my field mostly we deal with inequalities, so that's why it's rare to write equations these days. And uh, so, so this is equal to m p minus one divided by two times m, right? Mod P. Right? So, what is this number? Plus or minus one. Oh, 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 you said what? Plus or minus one. Plus minus one. one. Plus minus one. Plus minus one. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? So, this happened, that's why you can say it's blonde, like, love, love blonde number because he, he can take square root. It, it, it just happened to be true. A, so sometimes math are, uh, you know, just come easy for someone, right? And that's why people see yeah. elegant stuff. This, this just happened to be true, right? And, and why it's true? Clearly it's just true because, uh, you know, everyone can prove it's true like this, right? So you can see this is why this is totally is just is a taking square root. So basically, when you model prime p, P happen to have these properties. Then taking square root is trivial. All you need to do is just power it up to p minus plus one divided by four. 
So, so that's why you can see modular arithmetics is profoundly different from our traditional real number, complex number, integers, right? Because this is kind of crazy thing. We don't do this in the regular arithmetic domain, right? But the modular arithmetic, because they're group structures, created this sort of fantastic type of formulas. Somehow taking exponentiation, it's really almost in all time we just multiply or we divide or we take, you know, our traditional taking roots, right? So, so that's why you can see RSA built upon taking expo exponentiation. And uh, even we decide whether something is perfect square or not, we take exponentiation against the prime, right? And when we take square root for this particular domain, we also just take exponentiation, right? So somehow this exponentiation is uh, it's quite magic, right? This magic came from because there's a group behind it, right? Because, you know, there's a group behind it, it happened just to be true. Okay? So, so this, in my mind, absolutely gorgeous. It just happened to be true. Uh, and this, this is all based on up there, the assumption that P is a random prime such that... Uh, right, right. Uh, P so then you'll be asking how many such primes this also no. similar densities, yeah. There's a... There's a uh, so, so, so in many ways, if you, you know, people eventually made the conjecture on twin primes conjecture, right? So what is twin prime conjecture? That is, a, there's an infinite number of pairs of primes of the form P and P plus 2. That, that's called twin prime conjecture. It's infinite with some, such, such pairs, right? And so you can imagine this minor condition is nothing, right? You still, you didn't knock out the density of the prime. So, so which means that uh, you can still do the old trick. You draw random numbers, you test primes. Uh, your first mod four is bad, throw it away. Otherwise, you just test primes. Right? So you can still continue to do such an operation. And then basically, the beauty here is that uh, if you have this property, mod p and q, you can take square root. And if you take, uh, can take square root, so at least Rabin's encryption scheme can be decoded, right? So that's why he said that, so what, you have four rules when you write down a language to the ASCII code? What's probability the other three is still English? That's basically what he said, okay? Maybe one is in Chinese, but even that is highly unlikely, right? So, so, so you can see the, uh, so, so that's why he said there's some partial flaw in, in my encryption scheme, but nevertheless, I can decode right now, right? So, so, so everyone can see now, right? The review scheme decoding is just simply going the Chinese remainder theorem. You take, <laughs> you, you, your decoding is just going this. So, so here is the decoding algorithm. The decoding is you have your C, and you, you, you take a P plus 1 divided by 4 mod P, <coughs> and C, P plus 1 divided by 4 mod Q. And then you use the Chinese remainder theorem to map back into a number. So that's your, that's your plus minus. So actually, this is not even your plus minus m. That's all your four rules. Right? Because there's a plus minus here and a plus minus here. Right? You get your four roots. Right? That's all your four roots, right? Because you get plus minus here, plus minus here. Okay? Does the, the second one, is it supposed to be C raised to P plus 1? Oh, Q plus 1, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's, that won't help, yeah. It's a Q plus 1, Q plus 1, yeah. Okay? So this is basically, as a schema, it's really a scheme, right? So when you encrypt, it's fairly efficient, you just square it. So, so this clearly encryption, if your encryption is in a hurry, so that's why he defended his scheme. Encryption, probably mostly in, you're in a hurry because you want to talk to strangers. And decryption is a person who wants to think about your message, whether to reply. He said that he had a little bit more time to. Because this encryption essentially takes uh, uh, almost a linear time to compute using FFT. And decryption takes a quadratic time to degrade because you have to take an exponentiation. Okay? Okay. So decryption will. So, so any question up to here of the schema? The schema is totally simple, right? You, you choose your n, which multiple p and q, each other uh, uh, 
multiply equal to three Blum numbers, the product of Blum numbers, uh, and uh, <coughs> Blum primes, and then basically you take any message, you just square it, and when you decrypt, you get all the four roots back, and then basically you're looking which of the four roots is correct. Right. So, excellent. So the main thing which we want to establish is a breaking ribbon scheme is fractions. So I want to make a very strong statement. So breaking lead to a polynomial. <coughs> For this means uh, using randomization, randomized polynomial time algorithm. For factoring under this assumption, under that we normally stated. Okay. So, so this is uh, the main thing which I want to use as a, my second example of so-called reductions, right? So, because reduction technique is profound uh, necessary in essentially showing the security, right? And, and because ultimately we do make assumptions, and in some sense we have to tie uh, either the integrity of the uh, encryption scheme or security of encryption scheme to a certain computational or mathematical assumption, right? And computationally, when we tie security against hardness of other problem, fundamentally we are asked to prove that if you can break the schema, you can solve the other hard problems. Right? Fundamentally, we are asked to, to prove that thing. So which means that if you have an algorithm to solve this, you must have an algorithm to solve that. Right? So you are able to make a reduction for solving this problem into solving this problem. And uh, if such a reduction exists, it means that uh, if this is hard, this is hard. Right? This is just like the NP completeness reduction, right? If a uh, <coughs> partition problem can be reduced to three sets, it means that uh, you know, if you prove partition problem is hard, ultimately, that three sets have to be hard. Right? If you reduce the other way, three sets reduce the partition, then it means that uh, if you believe three sets is hard, that partition has to be hard, because otherwise you already solved the, the problem you state as hard. <coughs> so, so, so let me quickly make this argument, because this, in, in my mind, is probably the, one of the best applications of Chinese remainder theorem. It's really very highlighted by the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. So, so suppose we have such an algorithm. <clears throat> that is, uh, uh, I give you a perfect square in this domain, and you can get me a square root. Right? Suppose you, if, I, if, if I have uh, from m square, I can obtain one of the square roots. Right? So our purpose is to find P or Q, right? If you find P or Q, then you factor in the number, right? So, our, so, so currency is that I gave you a perfect square, I can give you back a square root, okay? So let, let's just think about uh, this a little bit, right? Is that uh, uh, imagine that you are the person who wants to find P and Q, right? So what you mean is you really don't care about square root. You just want to find P and Q, right? Your job, so your input is only N, right? Your input is N, right? Your input is N. And, 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 and uh, because 
this is the nature of public key encryption. The encryption scheme is public. You can produce a lot of perfect squares. How do you produce perfect squares? Take a random number to square the thing. Agree? If you take a random number you square it, then you get a perfect square. Right? Suppose let's let's just try out the following algorithm. Suppose I have a schema that uh, uh, try to attack the, 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 the ribbing scheme, right? And uh, suppose you made the following assumption. Whenever I give you a perfect square, you give me, me back all its four square roots. Suppose you give me back all its four square roots. Suppose the square root R, so it's, this is my uh, C, and suppose the square root R M1, M2, M3, M4. So suppose we, we have uh, C is equal to MI square model. Okay. Suppose you can give me back all the, all the uh, square roots. I claim you already factored. Let's just show you how dangerous it is, okay? If I gave you this, all the square roots, your factorization happened. If I, I just need one of the pair. I give you a perfect square, I give you all the four square roots. Factorization happen. Why? Let's just think a little bit, right? So if I, if you make this number, suppose we made this number, we choose m, we square it, we call it c, right? Which of the two square root we know? Trivially, right? So we already knew plus minus m, right? Mm -hmm. Because we knew if we produce a c, we knew m plus minus m is clearly a square root. Because we produce m, we produce we can produce negative m, right? So, so which means let's say those are those two, right? Suppose the first two are plus minus m, and suppose someone actually gave you m three. So I claim m three actually contains the factors of n. So if you know m and m three. M3 is not plus minus M. Then you actually factor it. Okay, let's, let's, let's just use it. Just look at the table of Chinese remainder theorem, right? The whole thing basically is a Chinese remainder theorem. This is model P and this is model Q, right? And it has four square roots with respect to M square, right? So one is uh, called uh, M and M. So this is mod P equal to M and the mod Q uh, equal to M. And this negative M, negative M, mod P equal uh, mod, mod uh, P equal to negative M and Q equal to negative M. Right? So those are your standard two square roots. Right. So what are the, the other two coordinates? It has to be minus M plus M and plus M minus M. So that's the other two coordinates, right? So which means, uh, so let's take M3 to happen to be here, right? So let's say M3 mod uh, P equal to M, and M3 mod Q equal to negative M. So what we look at this number, uh, M3 mod P equal to M, mod Q equal to negative M. Very good. There's only uh, P. There's only such combinations, right? And uh, so I claim. So if you look at it in this case, right? So uh, if this is the case, if this is the case, right? So this means that uh, suppose you look at the M. So what is M? So m equal to uh, m. So, so let me just write down the coordinates. So m three is a map to these coordinates, right? M and the plus m. And m is a map to coordinate m uh, 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 negative m two plus m, right? And if I add these two numbers, remember this isomorphism. The coordinates also add. So this means this will have uh, 2m mod p and 0 as q. 
right? So it means that, that this number is a multiple of Q. Agree? If this number is a multiple of Q, what is the GCD of N and this number? They both have Q as their prime factor. So this may be equal to Q. So this can write off by tiny remainder zero. He said that if you have a perfect square, you get all their four roots. <coughs> right. Particularly, you you made this perfect square. If you get any other non-trivial roots, then you factor a number because uh, all you need to do is just take a summation in mod p or mod q, uh, mod n. They will give you either p or q. Okay. They will give you either p. Or q. That's precisely this coordinates, right? Because if you take this, multiply this, it will cancel out the y of the coordinates plus this. This plus this will cancel out the first coordinate. So that means you are multiple of uh, Q and then you are multiple of P's, if you add it up. Right. So this means that uh, you can see if I give you all four square roots, so that's why ribbing scheme, the person who decode has to be very careful. Right? Once you decode the four roots, you have to really store, make sure you, 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 have to, you have to delete most of them. Right? Because if you keep all the four pairs, people discover, then, the, then it's broken. That all they need to do is summation and GCD. So, so now armed with this, how do we uh, use a way to break ribbon scheme to, to factor, factoring? So here is just simple like algorithm. Okay, so let's see. Right again. So this is reduction. So this is a ribbon reduction. <coughs> Remember the input is an uh, n, right? Input is n, right? And I want to factor it, right? So the first step, choose a random m, okay? From the n star. This you can do, right? Just take a random number from the n star, which you can do. And secondly, you compute c equals m square mod n, right? So then, three, you just gave the ribbon code breaker, you just give c, right? Because Ripping code breakers out that it will promise you to give you one square root. Right? Ripping code breaker will return one square root. Right? And that, that, that's what you call, right? The, you can break a uh, ribbon scheme, you have to get a square root out. Right? So, ribbing code, code breaker will give you M prime. Right? So, for if M prime is equal to, it belongs to plus or minus M. Then you do what? And try again. Else, right, M prime. You just do GCD, M plus M prime. So this, is the, the reduction, right? as simple as this. That is, uh, I created my own random message, since I knew, and I actually don't care. I just take a number, I square it. Then I feed into the encryption scheme, and then I ask the code breaker to give me a message back. Right? It's straightforward as this. And then you test whether the code breaker discover your own message, or ne negation of your message. If they did, what can you do? Nothing. You can't do anything. Right? Otherwise, you will just run the GCD. Right? So, why does this actually work? How come the ribbon code breaker doesn't always give you your own 
plus my M minus M back. That is because when you give to the code breaker, it does not know M. Right? You, pr you produce your own M. You, then once you have this M, you give it to the code breaker. Code breaker is written in such a way it doesn't know M. Right? That's by definition. It knows nothing about plain text. Right? So, so now the code breaker <coughs> facing four possibilities. It has to guess which one to give back to you. The code breaker has to give guess and give back to you. Agree? It has to guess. So how do you guess on something you don't know? That's how I used to take my GREs. You should take a random one. <laughs> right? So I only had one GRE technique. I go in, if I can eliminate the answer, I will take randomly among the left. <laughs> or if I can eliminate the two, I can take it randomly from the other two. If I don't know anything, I don't spread down anything because GRE punish you to do that, right? So that, that, that's all I remember is that. So that's why I find testing sometimes is really didn't re reflect what we know. It only reflect what we partially know, right? So uh, I score horribly in my verbal. <laughs> I think the lowest score I ever scored in any exam. <laughs> because most of the problems, I'm facing the same problem. Which of the four rules you want to reply? I just take a random one. Then they, they, they break it. Okay. So, so clearly, if, if you produce M, and if you choose a random one, 50% of the chance you will choose the wrong one. Right? Just like, like I, 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 I have a random uh, coin, 0, 1, uh, hand and tail in my hand. I also guess it. And your chance to guess it is no better than 50%. I leave no signals, right? So in this case too, this algorithm leaves no signals to here, right? You know, this is called as a black box. So which means <coughs> that uh, <coughs> the probability this happened is 50%. So 50% chance it will, uh, it will get a prime out. Okay. So this, in my mind, is one of the sort of really cool ways to look at the Chinese remainder theorem without any formula anymore. Right? All you need to do is just draw this coordinates, the, the four possibilities. Right. So, so any question you have to here? So this is a ribbon scheme, and this actually proof that uh, if you can, and this actually proof a quite st strong statement, right? If you can break a random message, I'm going to factor, right? Because I choose my random number to, to attack, right? So, so if you can break a random one, then I will come back to break it. Okay. So, <clears throat> so, so, so this in my mind is really the, the, the milestone is about at least this particular in, encryption scheme. And really scheme actually are quite widely implemented too, in part because uh, uh, in an asymmetric case that you want fast communication one way, and you don't care about, you know, the other side is doing server computation, you have more power, then it quite makes sense to have low exponents at the encryption side and has high exponents in the decryption side, right? So in some sense, RSA often us also encourage you to do this. It's just, you know, in their particular case, if you only run this way, uh, it's dependent upon, uh, yeah. Because the, the underlying assumptions are very different. Because there, they use the exponent with GCD against phi n is equal to 1. Here, we don't even care. Because the GCD of 2 against phi n is what? 2. Right? So this thing clearly is not relative prime to it, right? Because phi n is p minus 1 times q minus 1. So it's an even number. So, so the n, 2, is not even chosen by RSA because you can't. RSA is a unique mapping. <clears throat> so it also includes another interesting philosophy. Uh, I think uh, if you're interested in the recent development about coding theory, uh, you can Google online and you will define something called list decoding. 
So this is actually an interesting philosophy. What is list decoding? So remember that uh, uh, coding in a traditional way is try to make sure that uh, when you send your message, something corrupted, you can recover. Right? That's usually the, you know, read Solomon code developed here is mostly to accomplish that. Right? that the, when you need to send a, a tax, you send a little bit bigger tax. And if certain error happened, you can still recover the old tax. Right? So this, we used to say if you have a CD, you use a knife to make a cut, it's still playing. Right? Because this cut only smallly uh, perturbed the tax, and you can still get the, because it's redundantly encoded. Right, so, 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 so coding theory are often you, you by expanding the, uh, 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 the message, uh, you can be more resilient. In part because of certain noise happens, you can still recover. Right, and uh, so, so in coding theory, as uh, historically they develop, eventually they have certain information bond that people cannot overcome. That is, uh, you know, if you want to facing this type of error models. And, and, and you must extend your message at this rate. Right? This becomes the standard mathematical statement. So this decoding is one of the areas actually allow one to go under such a bound. So this decoding basically says the following. I'm going to give you a few guesses on what might be your original message. I don't know where, which one is, but I will tell you, your message is one of them. So that's called list decoding. So the answer is one of those in a small sense. Right? Usually we give answers and we say, that the, this is my answer. So imagine you're, sending, you're writing homeworks. You will, you, you, you will write four copies of homeworks. Then you will see one of them is correct. That's called list proof. Right? You, you, you answer my homework. Uh, you know, you, you did the four guesses of something. Then, but, but if they cover all the cases, one of them is the proof. Right. So this decoding essentially say one of the answer I offer to you is correct. I don't know which one. So to a certain degree, <coughs> uh, Ribbon's code is almost like a list decoding code for encryption. Right? Instead, of, I see a plain text, I got the cipher, a cipher text, I got the plain text back. I knew this decoding algorithm guaranteed the following: one of your plain text is in it, but he didn't know which one. Right? Because in this particular case. That uh, that we use in this particular, you didn't know which one, right? That's particular. But it's a list decoding way. Right? That is, a, one of the four of the message I decoded is correct message. Okay. So now uh, I would like to uh, move into our main topic for today. Maybe let's just take a break here. Yeah, I also need a little bit of water. So it's a